Hi everybody and uh, thanks for coming to the talk. Uh, my name is Indrani Medhi and I work as an associate researcher in the Technology for Emerging Markets group at Microsoft Research India in Bangalore here. And uh, today I'll be talking to you about work that we've been doing in design of user interfaces for people who are non-literate, who cannot read or write. So let me begin by telling you about my domestic maid and cook, Sumati. So Sumati is around 30 years old. She's already a mother of three kids. She's quite street smart. She is the main breadwinner of the family. Her husband doesn't have a regular job. She works at four households, you know, cooking, cleaning. But uh, Sumati never really had the opportunity to go to school. So she is not literate. But she has a basic mobile phone that she uses to make voice calls. And uh, she carries these little chits of paper with her where there's numbers written. And interestingly, even though she's not literate, she uh, can recognize numbers. So whenever she needs to make a call, she looks at the, this chit of paper and dials a call from scratch. So she doesn't even use the phone book. And I'm sure a lot of people in the audience would agree that you know a lot of people like Sumati. Maybe they are your drivers, maids, cooks, and cleaners. I think this is really a global phenomenon. 41% uh, of the population in the least developed countries are not literate. And research has shown that people who are not literate use mobile phones for making voice calls only and not for any kind of sophisticated usage. So, and if you look at cell phone penetration, it's quite high. In 2011, there were 5 billion mobile phone accounts across the whole world. And 60% of the subscribers lived in the developing countries. So given this you know, high penetration of mobile phones on one side and uh, non-literacy being the bottleneck on the other, the question that we ask in this research is, how do we create user interfaces such that any person who's not literate on first interaction with a PC or a mobile phone can extract information that's relevant to his or her life using very little or no assistance? So the way we solve this problem is by designing text-free user interfaces. Now, text-free user interfaces do not use any kind of uh, text. But there's some numbers, because people who are not literate can actually read numbers. Otherwise, it's a combination of voice, video, and graphics like you see here. The first two screens are a mobile banking application on cell phones. The next one is a job search app for domestic helpers, which is on a PC. So what is the process that we use to uh, develop these designs? We use what is known as an ethnographic design process. So basically, uh, you go into the field, and uh, like the previous speaker was saying, you talk to people who are potential users of your technology to understand their needs and requirements. And then once you've talked to them and you have this information, you come back to the lab and design these interfaces, and then go back to them, them again to understand whether they're usable or not. So you do usability tests. And this cycle is a very iterative design process. In the last uh, few years, I've talked to people in the Philippines, India, South Africa, and uh, talked to some 570 people spend some 700 hours talking to people in the field. And these are pictures of me talking to you know, fishermen and uh, farmers and domestic helpers across these three countries. OK, so uh, let us uh, sort of understand the context that you're talking about. So who are these people that you're talking about? Uh, the people that we are trying to design, uh, design for have informal sector jobs. So they could be drivers, cleaners, fishermen, uh, you know, uh, vegetable vendors, and so on. And uh, the household income, just to sort of uh, calibrate you, is between 2,500 to 8,500 Indian rupees per month. Uh, they have typically low levels of formal education, less than eighth grade. There's always a mix of people who use or do not use mobile phones. But across the board, we haven't spoken to anybody who, I mean, none of the people that we spoke to had any experience using computers. Uh, but there's a lot of other technologies that you see in people's homes. There's television sets, a lot of DVD players in low-income communities these days, and a lot of local languages that are also spoken. OK, so uh, what are the design applications that we're talking about here? The first application is a job search application for domestic helping jobs. So imagine like a knockery.com or a monster.com and uh, that to help you find cooking cleaning jobs. The next is a health information app which is installed as a public kiosk in a hospital waiting area in a public hospital. 
then there's map navigation, a mobile money transfer application, and then an uh, agriculture video search app, which uh, rural farmers in uh, India can use to look up best practices in agriculture through videos. Okay, uh, so given the theme of today is design for change, we're going to talk about the design principles that we came up with in these interfaces and the reasons why we came up with them. And before we do that, we need to understand you know, what is the problem with non-literacy? Initially, we had a very sort of focused, narrow view of non-literacy, and we thought, well, non-literacy means that people are not able to read text. Now, given that problem, what we do is that we do away with any kind of text in these interfaces, and uh, we provide a lot of graphics and imagery. The first graphic is uh, of, you know, get enough sleep, and this is the health application. The other is try to denote the address of the employer in the job search app. But the immediate next question is, what is the optimal visual representation for graphics? Uh, it could be any style of graphics, right? So to understand, uh, to answer that question, we do a controlled study where we compare different representation styles. And there's five representation styles that we uh, test with 200 people from low-income communities. The first is local language text. Those of you read Kannada can probably read this. The next is a static hand-drawn representation. And this is the graphic to represent high fever for the health application. Then there is a photograph. Then there's Animation, these are key frames of the animation for high fever. And finally, there's video. We do a control study and try to understand which of this is the best. And interestingly, and quite surprisingly, it turns out that static hand-drawn representation is the best understood. Why is that? We, after talking to people, we realized that a photograph has a lot of extraneous details that people get lost in. And on the other hand, a static hand-drawn representation has just the relevant amount of details that's easy to understand. Again, if you compare animation and video kind of motion graphics, uh, what happens is, so this is the main uh, gra activity that we're showing through the graphic, right? There's this person who's lying on a horizontal surface. There's a cold compress on the forehead to reduce fever, and there's hands next to the person. In the animation of the video, what happens is there's a context laying activity before the main activity. For example, you show some uh, two hands dipping this cold compress in water, wringing the cloth and bringing it to put the, on the forehead. So that action is confusing. So people got confused with the animation and video, but they understood the static much better. So we use static hand-drawn representations like this for the uh, interfaces. We also realized that there's a lot of attention that one needs to pay uh, to while designing these interfaces because people might have various psychological, cultural, or uh, language biases. Initially, to uh, you know, denote the uh, symbol for washing for this job search app, we had put utensils, the first graphic, and people thought of that as an object, just utensils, or a place where you wash utensils, that is the uh, wash area. The moment we introduce action cues like running water, that seemed to fix the problem. People immediately got it. Oh, this is the activity of washing. Uh, then there's cultural biases as well. The second graphic, the slow proof house, was used to denote the address of an employer for the job search app. But uh, when I showed it to people, they came and said, well, my employer lives in tall apartment complexes. They don't live in village huts. <laughs> Uh, and in design school, we were taught that you know, a slow-proof house is a universal symbol of a house. So with their feedback, we designed uh, this particular graphic, a tall apartment complex. There were also uh, language biases which people had. We were representing job timings with uh, sun and moon clock, so this is 5.30 to 7. But when we were talking to uh, participants who were Muslims, probably because Urdu is written from right to left, they were thinking of time in the other direction you know, reading Urdu. So with that feedback, we just introduced a simple arrow, and that fixed the problem. So there were lots of such subtle elements which uh, had to be, you know, thought of while designing these interfaces. People, like I said, are able to read numbers. So we have numbers in the UI, and it's probably because they used currency notes. And uh, so this is used to represent the wages that you'd get for a particular activity like washing or cleaning the house, etc. Okay, uh, so the other thing we noticed is that just the graphic by itself was not enough. So every graphic was annotated with 
a voice in the local language to explain what the graphic is. And it was amazing to see people get very excited about you know, the computer speaking in the local language. So a combination of voice and audio. OK, now let us revisit the question. Initially, when we asked the question, what is the problem with non-literacy? It's about reading text. But in our work, we find that non-literacy is correlated with a lot of other things which are beyond the strict inability to read. And to understand that better, let me give you some more context. So the people that we're talking about live in environments such as these. These are uh, scatter housing. You know, informal settlements, there's public water taps which are shared. There's shared bathrooms. And the point is that these are very low technology environments. So on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't come across high-end technology. These are the interiors of people's houses, uh, very cramped spaces. Six to eight members live in a one-room house attached to a kitchen. So a very low-tech environment. So the moment you put an expensive piece of technology, like a smartphone or a PC in front of them, there's immediately this sense of intimidation that, you know, if I don't use this device properly, if I break the device, I'd be taken to task for it. I might have to pay for it. And this intimidation is usually uh, more common with people who are a little older, and sometimes because of one's social standing, the fancier the device, the more the intimidation. And we've also seen that people are very, very sort of uh, scared to provide typed input. You know, like, if I touch the device, I'll break something, and God knows how I'll fix it. So instead of uh, touch, we uh, use speech input, which comes more naturally to people. So if you are able to develop automatic speech recognition for uh, your interfaces, you can use speech. And uh, for the agriculture video search app that I mentioned previously, uh, we saw that speech works really great when there's a long list of choices. Let's say 22 crops on the first page, and your user selection, your user input, comprises of short, familiar words. For example, just the name of the crop. You can say wheat, or in Hindi, makka, you know, which is maize, things like that. Short, familiar words, and it works great. Speech works for such uh, conditions. Okay, so another thing associated with non-literacy is that People require this frequent uh, prompting and reassurance that, hey, everything is fine. So on every screen, we uh, provide a consistent help icon. Sometimes it can be an animated character saying what to do. In some cases, it was my face <laughs> with instructions on what to do on the uh, application. One very important thing that we saw was that people had a lack of awareness of what a PC could deliver. So uh, they did not understand how information that's relevant to their life comes to be contained in a PC. Uh, imagine, you know, somebody who looks for jobs currently through informal social networks, through friends and family. I go to them and tell them, hey, you know what? From today, you're not going to talk to friends for jobs. You're going to use a computer, a black box, which will give you all your information. So people have absolutely no cognitive model of how that might work. Uh, Initially, we had an instructional demo, which was a regular, you know, over-the-shoulder shot of somebody using a PC and this job search application using a stylus. And uh, after that, uh, seeing that video, you were supposed to use the application. But this instructional demo did not work with people. They were like, what is going on? How do I need to apply this to the actual application? So what we did was we wrapped this instructional demo in a story, which is like a TV soap. You know, we all watch TV soaps, and we love TV soaps. So there's a TV soap which is sort of wrapped around this instructional demo. And the job search app goes like this. Uh, there's a middle class couple who, who cannot find a domestic helper. Wife is always complaining, you know, what do you do? So the husband says, okay, let me uh, insert our requirements to our home computer. On the other side of the application, there's a, a domestic helper who's looking for a job. And she has not found one, so she's very depressed. The uh, NGO worker comes along and says, hey, you know what? This is an application which can help you find a job. Come, I'll uh, show you how to use it. And she takes her to the NGO office and shows her the actual demo of the application. And then the, uh, I don't know if you can see the last part one image, the domestic helper sees this job and she's like very excited. Oh, yeah, I love this job. And she lands at the doorstep of the employer and gets the job. So the moment this video was given to people, they immediately got it. You know, like they understood where information was coming from. They were able to identify with a peer the other domestic helper in the video who was looking for a job. And uh, they also sort of, the, the video set the motivation for them to understand uh, how, this, how things would work and you know, how they might get a job themselves. So full context video was very useful. 
I guess most of you in this audience today have touchscreen phones, right? Uh, but a lot of the people in low-income communities still have phones with keypads. And uh, do you know what are soft keys? The soft keys are the buttons which are located alongside the display of the phone, the functions of which keep on changing depending on the application. And mapping that to the actual uh, uh, button is very difficult for people who uh, are, uh, are in our target segment. So we're saying minimize soft key uh, mapping and you know, provide direct input mechanisms. This is the mobile uh, money transfer app. So we have very little, uh, OK, the text has overflowed. But we have very little uh, soft key mapping. And you, know, you try to provide direct input mechanisms. You could use touch. You could, uh, like I mentioned previously, use speech input, which comes more naturally to people. Finally, we see that you know, using a hierarchical information architecture is difficult for people. You know, information in most applications are organized hierarchically. And uh, that information architecture could be really difficult for people. So uh, we recommend using a linear navigation model because it's like it uses the metaphor of turning the pages of a book, right? You go from one page to another, and it's like page turn. Use that uh, metaphor. And it's not also good to provide everything at one shot to the user uh, in one screen because it's very overwhelming. So maybe uh, six items per page. Uh, and you know, with a page turn metaphor, you just use uh, a graphic like this, you know, going from one page to another. OK, so uh, these are the design principles that we came up with. Very little, uh, you know, uh, absolutely no text, a lot of graphics, and static hand-on representations, some use of numbers, voice feedback, direct input mechanisms, speech, help, you know, linear navigation, full context video. Now, applying all this, are people able to use these text-free user interfaces? We do very controlled usability tests, trying to see if people are, in fact, able to use uh, these UIs. And over the course of last few years, I've tested uh, these UIs with more than 150 people. The picture you previously saw is a group of older patients using this public kiosk in a hospital in Coimbatore. Um, they're all not literate. We can see that people actually are able to complete the tasks that we give them uh, you know, quite o very often, more quickly, and requiring less assistance. But now, going back to the bigger question, uh, you know, have we been able to solve the problem of creating UIs that uh, non-literate users can use with very little assistance? I think I uh, think of the problem as you know solving a Rubik's cube. We are still trying to get all the pieces together. You know, we are not yet there. We are on our way uh, on the problem, and uh, the way to think about it is. It's not just the inability to read which impedes uh, you know, a knowledge user not being able to use interfaces. There's lots of other things that you need to think about when designing for knowledge users. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot.